Okay, Paul. Paul Newton, are you there? I am indeed, Phil. Yes, thanks very much. much. Um, Good. For I'm speaking it out, so it's over to you now, mate. All right, no problem at all. Um, thanks, Phil. Um, for those of you who don't know me, Paul Newton, I work at Nigel Wright Recruitment. Um, I work in the IT team. In terms of the roles that I have handled over the last seven years plus within IT, they've included information security, cyber security roles from you know, analyst officers up to head of type positions. And um, clearly that the talk, the presentations this afternoon have been fascinating. And I think what's clear to see is that um, people in this field come from a broad range of backgrounds and have very different areas of specialism. Uh, and I'm actually interested to find out a bit more in, in certain, certain aspects. I mean, I wanted to ask, just to kick off the discussion, um, Freya, uh, clearly, you know, working at Accenture, um, big blue chip organization, um, what, what would you think uh, is key these days to getting into information security and has, have the skills required now compared to what they were, say, a year or so ago? Have they changed, do you believe? Yeah, good question. Um, what I would say that from what I've seen and experienced is I think there is now more of acknowledgement um, than ever before of the different types of skills required. So I think there's traditionally been a tendency um, both to market and, and indeed from organisations such as Accenture to look at um, STEM backgrounds, computing science, engineering. Um, we now proactively recruit from across the board. So we, we look at humanities um, graduates, we look at people with criminology degrees, we look at people with computing science degrees. Because if you look at the fundamental issues that we will be tackling as a next generation of cyber threats, yes, we need those um, hard technical degrees, but we need to look at issues from a range of different perspectives. Um, and therefore, I think um, a variety of skills are required. So, you know, it, people engagement, interacting with stakeholders, what is the final product to be delivered? Yes, we need to talk to architects as well. So I, I would say there is now probably more of an awareness and, and certainly companies like ours are looking um, beyond the typical um, STEM degrees. I mean, don't get me wrong, STEM is just as important, but there is now an acknowledgement that it's wider than just STEM. And, and hopefully coming from you know, a legal background, um, I'm evidence that, you know, you, you can make a career in this space and have a good time. So the members of the panel have a view on that, and how things have changed? And Paul, obviously in your business, I mean, are you quite narrow in terms of the, the focus of the type of people that you would employ, for instance? Yeah, we're, um, it is quite narrow. We pretty much all just do pen testing, um, vulnerability assessments, um, and it's to get to be a good pen tester, you really need to have sort of have been in the industry for a little bit. So what makes a great web application pen tester is, a, is an ex-developer, but you also need the ability to articulate what those issues are. Um, and, and you find that the, the more technical people get, maybe the, the, the less people person they are, that's probably a, a wrong generalization, um, but it, it's, it's, it's sometimes quite hard to find sort of someone who's an excellent technical, but who's excellent at reporting and to getting that um, information across to their development team and their management team um, to be able to sort of understand the issues and the threats and uh, everything like that. And, and related to that, clearly people in your area are predominantly from a development background. How easy, I mean, I obviously I deal with a variety of security roles in, in my role. If you try and pigeonhole them into two principal areas, there are the or compliance-based roles, and then there are more technical-based roles. How easy is it, in your view, for, for someone, maybe not you know, to become a fully-fledged pen tester on day one, but how easy is it to actually transition from, more, say, a more compliance to a technical role, or is that very difficult to do? We find it to be quite hard, to be honest. Um, I think you generally need a good grounding. In, in any sort of auditing, you need to really understand or be at the top of your game for what you're auditing, whether you're auditing books, you need to be an accountant. Uh, you need to understand, the, especially when it comes to web applications or infrastructure, a bit less, but web applications, you need to understand how JavaScript is written. You need to understand how all that works. And then when you're testing it, you can sort of say, oh, yeah, that's how it works. Um, but if, if you weren't maybe a JavaScript programmer and you were testing a JavaScript application, you might struggle a little bit to uh, work out what everything's doing. Mm -hmm. 
Phil, um, on the basis that obviously you've come from more of an, an infrastructure networking security um, background, what would your view be on that, that the same question in terms of how technical people need to be to specialise in, in that field, Phil? Is that Phil me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Phil, Phil Irving. Sorry, Phil. Phil Irving, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I think it's interesting, to be honest. Um, and I'm, if you'd asked me this two years ago, I think I probably would have jumped and said that they have to be quite technical in the background. Um, but I have a, an interesting student in a positive way who has actually come from the banking sector. So she, this student has worked um, in the banking sector in quite a senior role, um, but has decided to reskill in um, cybersecurity. Um, and as a temporary job, a, a leading bank has snapped her up almost inter interest instantly because of the, the blended skills. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think it's, there's, there's both sides. I think the technical skills are very important, but, um, and I would suggest this to any student, whatever you do, do not uh, forget the skills that you've got. So somebody coming from the, the say the factory floor, um, where they have a lot of programmable logic controllers and things, um, <clears throat> a lot of those PLCs have never been updated since the year dot. Um, and in which case, um, it's knowing about these systems, knowing about their vulnerability, well, knowing about the systems, knowing what they do in an organization. And therefore, um, I suppose it, it, that would give you the edge on the, the cyber security aspects in that area. Sure. You would need to know about the exploits, um, but it's fundamentally understanding the area as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would your view, Colin, in, in terms of your area, especially? I mean, clearly, you've come from the, the police force uh, as well as other experience. You muted, Colin. <laughs> Colin, you muted. <laughs> Oh yes, it will. I IT literature, I think. <laughs> the, um, yeah, um, basic IT skills, yes. However, it's it's such a sort of specialist uh, department that uh, the students are looking to come into. That re really, we um, or you know, when I, I sort of uh, head the modules, um, you start first and then work work on and build up your experience through the second and then into your final year and then doing your projects. But um, the, the idea is to give students a grounding and then look towards more towards the final year. OK, then how can I use my, my digital forensics in, in other fields as well as, uh, you know, um, uh, the digital forensic arena? So, um, I don't think there needs to be a lot of background in it because we take them from right through from the start and work way through. I've introduced other things into the courses, such as um, because I've done uh, work, work with industry, you know, um, things like uh, interviewing techniques, how to deal with clients, you know, uh, introduce that within group work so, so that they're getting a feel and being able to present uh, being able to, to um, say, for example, one of the assessments I do is where the, the students have to interview. And I bring a, a lawyer in who's the client representing a company that's been subject of a breach. And then the students have to interview that lawyer, glean the information, go away and create a forensic strategy, then come back and present that. Now, that's exactly what I was doing in industry, you know. So I've, I've tried to bring the practical side um, to the course, as well as needing to know the technical side is, you know, understanding the software, its capability, how to, how to, um, how to analyze data, that sort of thing. And, and then, then produce your, your results in, in sort of industry recognized way that, you know, that uh, companies or lawyers uh, are going to expect to see. 
Sorry, did that answer your Did I go off a oh, tangent yeah. there? <laughs> no, no, it did answer my question. Actually, one thing that I'm interested to understand is, you know, it's it's a fast moving field. Have, have you seen any marked in, a difference in terms of the type of people that you're attracting to your courses, both you, to you and Phil? No, there's a, there's a few uh, few more international students. You know, a lot of countries aren't. We, the UK and America kind of lead the way uh, in in a, in a lot of aspects of uh, digital forensics. Um, perhaps more international students. Uh, uh, well, what will happen this year? Uh, watch this space, but uh, that that's probably where I noticed the difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Freya, on a similar point, just to expand on that. Clearly, you're mentioning about different types of graduates that Accenture recruit from you know, different courses, humanities courses, you know, not just technical STEM based courses. Would, would an employer like, like Accenture recruit more people who have a bit more work experience, but in, in other areas, um, but then want to have that kind of career change? A bit like yourself, I suppose. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think there's, there's probably two, two points to the que um, question. I think Yes, we, we, we do have um, a specific focus and attention on and the range of skills, so, so the non-technical routes and getting them in and training them. We, we also invest very heavily in, um, for example, ex-forces um, candidates who, mm -hmm. who, who you know, have, have got amazing life skills from, from their time in service and um, have done some training um, post leaving the armed forces. Um, and uh, employers like Accenture are very keen to get such candidates bring them in, bring, bring the, you know, the amazing life skills that they've got, the problem solving, um, et cetera, and then putting them into different domains of which cybersecurity is certainly one. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen quite a lot of increase in, in that area. And, I, and I've got to say, um, by personally working with such um, individuals, that they've been a huge, huge success. I think the key, key, key uh, Phil, Paul, sorry, is always um, the aperture to learn and adapt and be agile. And I think if you have these core elements, yes, there is hard grunt involved, you know, learning technical skills, learning specifics, um, doing exam certifications, etc. But I think that agility in, in individuals and that life experience they can bring has, has in, in our case, at Accenture, um, with the relevant backing and investment, probably to be a good success. Yeah. I mean, I, just my own experience, I, I would certainly back that up in terms of people coming from the forces background. That seems to be quite a popular route. People with those op operational uh, procedural ex you know, experience, uh, you know, they seem to be able to move into this kind of field relatively easily, actually. Um, so I'd certainly, uh, I was interested to know that Accenture actually recruit those type of staff yes, as well. Because I, I know it, often those people tend to move within sort of government departments uh, more often. The sort of the, so actually to get them into working in the, uh, in the private sector as well, is it's, it's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> what about the two guys in the police force? I mean, uh, Gareth, Paul, what are your views in terms of the, the backgrounds of how people get into it? Because I know, you know, some of the, you come through the police force, but um, would you consider taking uh, people on from the outside world, as it were? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, um, Paul's muted. Good job, just showing. Um, yeah, in, <laughs> increase, increasingly so. Um, we, I think, we realised um, probably after uh, Collins' day when he was in the police that we couldn't man all the all the necessary posts that we needed to from police officers themselves, because um, as Colin will remember, there's a lot of police officers out there that um, can't seem to get a printer to work or have any interest in, in knowing some of the finer points of a program like Word. So. Yes, increasingly we are seeing uh, interns coming in. We, we are, um, we've got a team of cyber volunteers that uh, are postgrad students, undergrad students that we um, cover our network right across the country that pitch in where they can. Um, so yeah, it, it, from a policing standpoint, it's not just cops doing the technical roles anymore. Mm -hmm. Especially when you consider as well, sort of like 10 or 15 years ago, one cop would be looking at a hard drive that maybe had 20 or 30 gigabytes of data on it, but now yeah. we're sifting through five, six terabytes. I mean, obviously the software for searching through that's got better, but it still requires more hours, more effort. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there is a there is a, a strong dependence and reliance upon um, volunteers and employees who aren't police officers. 
I think if, if I could mention that, I, I mean, I can remember when I first started off, uh, everyone was uh, ex-police, you know, ex-cops and that. Uh, where I'd, I'd be interested to know what the percentage is now within the high-tech crime unit. I would think it's much higher percent in Northumbria police uh, that are civilian employees rather than um, coming through the, the police route. Yeah, as, as a snapshot, we can give a, an example of Northumbria's um, cybercrime department at the moment, which is staffed by uh, DI, uh, DS, two DCs, and the rest of the team is staffed by civilians. Civilian researchers, analysts, um, protect officers, um, pursue officers, not pursue officers, um, prepare officers. Um, so yeah, a lot of the roles are being given to police staff, and that's not to say that the the service has been diluted by any stretch of the imagination, because people are coming into this role um, with vastly superior set, uh, skill set than what, um, what what you could reasonably expect police officer that spent the past you know, five, ten years, you know, pounding the big dealing with drugs. So, Paul, can I just ask, uh, come in here, there's a question on, online for Gary and Paul, just asking about volunteer opportunities and how people can uh, get involved in helping out their local communities. Right. We've got the Cyber Volunteers Scheme, which is run by Johnny and John, but that's um, driven, like, they basically do they ask for people when they need them. At the minute, they've got a full uh, complement complement of yeah. people who don't need any more. Um, but we, we did recently, it was about, was it a year and a half ago they got all the volunteers together or so? It wasn't that long ago. That I think there's between 15 and 20 of them. Um, it's one of those things you kind of just have to look out for. Um, that's for us as a rock you. All the forces individually as well will do a similar sort of thing for volunteers. But... Um, uh, at the minute, I don't know of anything going volunteer-wise, but that's not to say it wouldn't come up in the future because it definitely would. And there was yeah, not a, 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 sorry. Sorry, I was just, just going to say, in our experience, I know certainly Durham Constabulary have a volunteer system. I think we we referred some guy in a while back who I think does some volunteer work and he's a he's a cyber professional. So uh, there, I think yeah. all, probably all the forces uh, do oh. something similar. I just, I just wouldn't know about how it's manned at this moment in time. Yeah, like, like Gareth says, they, they do, we, we do have, every police force in the country now has a contingent of uh, volunteers and that will come in and assist with investigations or with any kind of um, like cyber or digital forensic work. But the experience that we can offer and the, the investigations that we can put people in on, on like the front line and deal with, uh, it's valuable work experience for people. So as you can imagine, these roles are quite highly sought after and, and they get quite competitively um, attacked by people that want to do these roles. So at the moment, so there, there is no space, but like Gareth said, it, I think it's just a case of keeping an eye out on your local forces website and we will advertise for volunteers as and when, you know, the, the, the need arises. One of my first year students has in fact got into Northumbria Police because he saw advertised for uh, the volunteer so he's looking at it, potentially I'll get the experience, it's going to help me later on, you know, for, yeah. from a CV perspective. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and that's what a lot of people are looking for. We have an intern at the moment, and his first job is working for a regional organised crime unit, helping our pursue officers um, deal with like serious and complex uh, digital cyber investigations. And we were, we were talking on the other day, Gareth and I, and I said, my first job was washing dishes in a restaurant. You know, <laughs> and his first job is dealing with, you know, like tr tracking down like bitcoins and you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a completely different world from what it was when I first joined the police. Mm -hmm. I mean, cyber security, as I said earlier, covers such a broad range of, of skills. Um, and, you know, certainly if I look back at, you know, when I was a student or thinking about being a student, I wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't even cross my, my mind. A lot of people don't necessarily be are actually self-aware at this age when they're looking to embark mm -hmm. on a career. And, and maybe they think about, well, they, they're in, potentially interested in cyber, but they're not sure that's the only thing they're interested in. Are there, you know, clearly, I imagine there are quite a lot of different career paths they can still follow, but still keep their options open that they could move into cyber. What would any of you view on that? Are there certain courses maybe to avoid or certain ones that just it's good to get a broader generalist background 
uh, which will still leave that option to move into cyber in the future open. Oh, I'll leave that one to Paul. <laughs> um, was that for me or was that for the entire panel? For anyone, anyone. Uh, to know thank that. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's a difficult question. It is because I'm, I'm thinking you know, I want to be a cyber security professional. Well, yeah, yeah but what aspects of cyber because it is so broad. I mean, I mean uh, Paul Jenkins mentioned there that it's a, you know, he probably in the area of pen testing or becoming an ethical hacker, you probably need to be a developer by background. And therefore, you probably need to have a number of years under your belt being a, a real hard code techie. Um, if you want to go, you know, in my view, from a recruiter's perspective, you could be an auditor of, of some description, maybe a financial auditor initially, then maybe move across to an IT auditor, and then move from that field maybe into information security, because I know people who have made that moves. Other other ones that you'd say were, were better than others? I'll, I'll come in here on this one, Paul. Um, so the way that we, we're constructed in Accenture is we, we've split cyber into five categories and it ranges from, um, I'd say the very non-technical side of security strategy and risk essentially, mm -hmm. going to identity access management, application security, um, managed security services, so your SOC analysts and cyber defense, um, the title, threat intelligence, uh, pen penetration tests, etc. And what we found works quite well is for um, the graduates that we're taking in um, that come from a non-technical um, background will most likely sit within our strategy practice or sort of security strategy practice and really help with a lot of security audits, comp compliance controls, etc. Um, but as part of that work, um, if you look at digital identity, so implementing a new identity and access management program across an enterprise, yeah. as technical as that can be, um, you do need a lot of the softer skills. So the requirements gathering, understanding what the purpose and the benefit to this is um, to said organization. And through that kind of softer introduction, you can build up and rapidly upskill yourself in technical protocols and products and services and therefore almost have a gentler transition into what would be seen as a more technical um, area of security. So when, certainly when I go out to recruit and we interview graduates um, etc looking at that kind of flexibility um, and, really, and, and a willingness to um, being able to adopt and, and upskill very quickly I think is more key rather than seeing doing a hard core technical degree. I mean, if, if your aim is to be, you know, a SOC analyst or a pen tester, yes, of course, we need, we need that technical background. But if you're open to working your way through the map, as I call it, of the different domains and in, in, um, cyber, and the fact that the threats are changing so rapidly as well, we need people to be constantly upskilling and staying one step ahead of the attackers. So to me, that's a more of a fundamental point that I certainly look for. If I could add something to that, actually, a little bit. Um, Obviously, coming from a non-technical background, ac academically wise, to come into doing a PhD, I actually set out into this venture not knowing what I wanted to do. That makes any sense. It was yeah. sort of handed to me on a silver platter to go on the computing. Um, I went into it and thought, I like coding, did a bit of coding. I, I got a first class degree in it, but I don't really enjoy it. Um, and then I've ended up coming into cybersecurity and end up here on a PhD. So necessarily, I didn't set out to get into cybersecurity, I sort of fell through multiple different paths to get here. Um, and luckily for me, I'm sort of, I, I, I get along with everything really. I don't specialize in one particular thing. I, I can do coding, databases, anything, but it's strange to think that I've ended up here without actually having a strategy in mind. Can I just come in, Paul, because I think, uh, I know it's another university, but Northumbria University run a scheme called Cyber Guardians, which is All encouraging right. um, much older people than myself to get involved in, uh, in cybersecurity and that as a way to helping uh, people of the sort of same sort of age come to terms with it, to find it easier to engage with people of a similar age to them. So I think it, it goes, there's something for everybody in this. Yeah, no, certainly. And Kimberly, on, on the same slant, I mean, clearly you, you came into cyber again, you know, after doing, doing something else in, in your career. How did you How make that uh, transition? Um, well, I'm quite at the start because I'm actually just doing some work experience. I've actually not got a role yet. No, um, I appreciate that, yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, like I said, it, I just, I don't know, sort of 
became fascinated by it and um, saw it in the news constantly and then the more I looked into it I realised my analytical skills seemed to align with it and I thought if I could just um, say they want people who can communicate well and um, high levels of report writing, be analytical, but if I can learn some more technical skills then I'd be, uh, be able to get into the industry. But it's interesting um, what people are just saying, how cause it's so vast I think I've said to other people how it's almost like medicine. You don't just train in medicine and work in medicine, do you? There's, there's lots of different parts to it. So I guess um, specialised seems to be quite key. Yeah. Actually, one thing I've noticed that, you know, obviously in terms of entry, we're talking about getting into cybersecurity in the first instance. One thing we haven't touched on was specifically probably all the, you know, the certifications that are out there. There are actually millions of them, <laughs> as far as I can see. I mean, uh, ultimately, you know, in terms of the more senior management roles, we talk about CIS was mentioned uh, by Bill Urban, and, uh, and people that tend to come the compliance route to the CISM. Um, both chapters I'm, I'm, I'm involved with, one, one more so than the other up here in the Northeast. So there are various certifications that people can back up their experience. By, by doing, although clearly you need one with the other, you can't just do the, um, the certifications. But I think doing the masters as you are would certainly help in that regard. Oh, definitely. But the experience is an interesting thing because I had a few different work experiences set up um, pre-pandemic, and then they all seem to get cancelled um, as places start to lock down. So I would definitely say, um, I guess if there were employers on the webinar to say definitely. Um, open up things to work experience for people. Um, I think it's so valuable, and um, yeah, I feel very lucky to have found the one I have. But that has just been through, um, I guess, networking, trying to build connections, um, and talking to different people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, otherwise, I, I find it actually quite hard to get work experience. Um, I guess pre COVID. Why, why do you think that is? I don't know, actually. Um, Maybe I, I should be more specific about what I was looking for, or, um, but yes, um, I guess the, the fact that everything's more remote nowadays, um, so there was lots of offers that have come into the office and we'll talk and you can sit with our person doing this, or like you can sit in our SOC team and and um, have a look, and then that's not happened because of um, people working from home. Um, so yes, no, I'm, I'm not 100% sure really. Mm -hmm. So do, do people think that, you know, if people like Kimberly and, and Dominic, in, in, if he wants to go into the, to work in the, in the commercial world in due course, do you think that bridge into it, getting that first job as a graduate, whether it's a master's or, or a PhD student, doing that leap into the commercial world is still going to be problematic, despite the fact there's still a great shortage of cybersecurity professionals? Definitely. I think the certifications is something that organisations are really looking for. If you look at job offers, I, I did a little section on job roles out there, and you do need some skills as well, but quite a lot of them want an abundance of these certifications. You know that a lot of them cost a lot of money, um, which simply, if, if you're just graduating, you don't have that money to go in and get the certification. So how are students meant to then get into the foot into a job, you know, because I think one of the things with Kimberley is when you're joining an organisation on an internship, are you then getting trusted to handle secure information? The organization's happy to give that to someone who's just training, you know? So it's, it's all it's the psychological aspects. It's trust um, and the certifications well in finance, which hopefully after this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, things might change, but we don't know. That, so people generally think that that's still going to be a challenge going forward, getting that first step on the ladder then. Phil Jackman, what do you think on that? I think that uh, all players have to be a bit more inventive in the way that they are approaching the market. I think we've seen a, a fundamental shift in the way that people work. Um, we're doing things now that couldn't said couldn't be done a few months ago. People would never work from home. We couldn't trust them. It's all about being there and seeing what we can do. So I think we need to take those lessons and apply them to think about how we could approach this problem in a different way, in a more distributed way. And I think organisations like Dynamo Big companies like Accenture, Sage, et cetera, has a, have a, a more a larger role to play. People like yourselves, Nigel Wright, the recruiters, yeah. looking for different ways of approaching this problem. Mm -hmm. I think that is a bit of a legal question at the moment where a lot of us are working from home, if not all, but you know, an increasing amount of time. Onboarding, I mean, it, 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 
can be tricky enough for some employers to involve people remotely. It, it's clearly happening a lot more now. I think most employers have got over that hurdle. I suppose the next stage is, is, is them uh, onboarding people, you know, into their first job or into internships. Uh, and I, I think that, that's, that's a hurdle we still probably possibly need to overcome. I think that's I said, cool. I think it's an interesting sorry. angle of how do you keep security secure? How do you keep, how do you yeah. try people who yeah. are new to security in a secure environment where they can make mistakes and, and won't cost the company? Yeah. <laughs> we need to look at. I so, think the other thing is as well, we were mentioned getting your foot in the door, but I think it's important to think about career changes as well. So it might be that, um, somebody has a particular background. So um, there's a couple of, that actually spring to mind with me. Um, one was when I was doing some work with a student and we were looking into um, cyber security for the marine industry. Um, and this guy had uh, a lot of experience. He had years of experience in the marine industry. Um, and he said that it was impossible to hack a ship. Um, but what I actually turned up, um, was quite an interesting article where, um, they ha it had been discovered that it was possible. Um, if you look at these huge automated ports where the, 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 the cranes are pretty much automatically lifting the, the containers onto the ship, um, and they, they, they know the weights of the containers and therefore, there's an algorithm places the containers correctly on a ship so that the weight is evenly distributed. Uh, and it was proved that you could um, actually attack that system and you could mess it up. So it put all of the heavy containers on one side of a ship. And then finally it communicates um, the sort of bill of lading with the ship. Um, and then the ship calculates that it sees the weight as being on the, the other side, so it fills its ballast tanks, and the effect is that it rolls a ship over in port uh, and blocks the port. Now, unless you had the experience from the marine industry, you wouldn't have actually picked that, that up as something that could happen. Um, and there was a huge case um, that's kind of widely reported as, as who turned the lights out in the Ukraine, um, but during a Ukrainian winter, um, somebody hacked into the electricity network, uh, which is all uh, controlled by PLCs, and they actually switched off um, the electricity supply to huge areas of, of the Ukraine, actually tripping out um, the circuit breakers in substations. And then they actually uploaded some firmware that prevented them from being remotely reset. Uh, so again, whoever did that had a good knowledge of the electricity industry, um, but apparently it took them six months to actually get back to the, uh, to the correct position that they were before the attack. So uh, whenever I see somebody coming in from a career change, I'm, I'm always kind of, um, let's have a look at what your background is. Let's kind of talk about it and see how you can use your experience together with the skills that you're going to get from us or from your certifications and then actually go back into that industry you might you you know you, you're going back into the same industry but you are career changing to a different role can i just uh, come in at, uh, Paul, because uh, steve blanks would like to ask a question if that's okay definitely not <laughs> I don't know. Somebody needs to put some cyber security on Phil Irvine and stop him interrupting, but never mind. Um, hi, guys. Um, I'm Steve Blanks. I'm program lead and also principal lecturer at the, uh, for the Institute of Coding and also University of Sunderland. First of all, just to say a big thank you to all the speakers because we part uh, jointly uh, partnership with uh, Dynamo to deliver this. Um, so great session, everybody. Um, I'd just like to ask a question to everybody about what's the first starting point? So I know nothing about cyber security. What, what would I do first? What would be the first thing I do? if I wanted to get into this career. And I know I would say going to university, but that probably wouldn't be the very first step. So question to everybody. <laughs> well, I definitely have something to, to add to that. Um, I would say um, join, join the community. Um, I found um, 
joined the Ladies Hacking Society is so valuable. People share advice and ideas, opportunities, um, and yeah, so I think um, in the North East we're very lucky, we've got things like OWASP, Newcastle, ISC Squared, um, Hacking Society, we've now got a new Death Con, Newcastle, um, there's lots of different meetup groups, I, and I think um, that's a, a great way of connecting with people. Thanks, I would say um, use the BBC News mobile app and sign up to the cyber security stream and just actually have a look to see what's happening. It's, it's quite amazing what's going on out there. So I would say um, I agree entirely with Kimberly and Phil, but uh, I, there's plenty of information from the National Cyber Security Centre and uh, you know there's lots of, of great tools on there like just to give it a try and uh, have a go at some of these things. Yeah, and I'll just echo what Kimberly said. Um, just as a practical tip, I would just go on LinkedIn and start following some top influencers just to understand the breadth um, of what cybersecurity is. I think sometimes cybersecurity can be, um, you know, anonymous with penetration testing or, or, or SOC analyst, where it's actually the range of the work in cyber is so vast and so diverse. So just go and follow the top five or 10 people and just see what they're up to, what they're writing about and what the issues are that they're trying to tackle. Excellent. Can, I, can we call that a wrap then, Paul? We can, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>